war in the Middle East now, where the United States has proposed a draft resolution at the United Nations Security Council, calling for a temporary ceasefire in the Gaza Strip, making it the first time Washington is proposing the word ceasefire. The U.S. draft also warns Israel not to launch a ground offensive in Rafah, saying the Security Council should underscore that such a major ground offensive should not proceed under the current circumstances. Last month, Algeria put forward an initial draft resolution which would demand an immediate humanitarian ceasefire in Gaza, but U.S. Ambassador Linda Thomas Greenfield signaled the draft would be vetoed. More than a million displaced Palestinians who represent about half of Gaza's population are crammed into Rafah after being forced to seek shelter there. The southern city, which borders Egypt, was home to only 250,000 people before the war. There is royal interest in the Middle East. The future King of England, Prince William, says he wants to see an end to the fighting in the Middle East as soon as possible. The Prince of Wales was there, uh, says there is desperate need for increased humanitarian support to Gaza and for hostages to be released. He was speaking ahead of a visit to Mount Humanitarian Support in Gaza. The Prince's visits will provide a symbolic recognition of the suffering of those caught up in the conflict. He'll hear from those providing humanitarian support in the Middle East and is expected to hear first-hand accounts of the pressure on those working in Gaza. In the meantime, the World Health Organization says it's completed a second evacuation mission from Gaza's Nasser Hospital. Officials say they transferred a total of 32 critical patients, including children, from the facility amid ongoing hostilities, while 18, 118 patients are still trapped inside the hospital complex. Efforts to evacuate the remaining patients are underway. The situation inside the hospital, which the Israeli forces turn into a military base, has exceeded the level of disaster and constitutes a direct threat to the lives of the staff and patients. According to the Palestinian Health Ministry, at least 103 people have been killed in Israel's attacks across Gaza in the past 24 hours, taking the death toll to 29,195 since the October 7 attacks. Meanwhile, a comprehensive report released by the Global Nutrition Cluster has found that a sharp rise in malnutrition among children, pregnant and breastfeeding women in the Gaza Strip poses grave threats to their health. As the ongoing conflict in the Strip enters its 20th week, the incredible scarcity of food and water widespread in diseases are compromising women and children's nutrition and resulting in a surge of acute malnutrition. The report's Nutrition Vulnerability and Situation Analysis Gaza finds that the situation is particularly extreme in the northern Gaza Strip, which has been almost completely cut off from aid for weeks. Nutrition screenings conducted at shelters and health centers in the north found that one in six children under the age of two are acutely malnutritioned. Malnourished, beg your pardon. Of these, almost 3% suffer from severe wasting, the most life-threatening form of malnutrition, which puts young children at highest risk of medical complications and death unless they receive urgent treatment. The wars in Ukraine and in Gaza top the agenda of the world's largest meeting for security policy in Munich, Germany. At the 60th conference, uh, UN Security Secretary General Antonio Guterres called for a new global order that works for all. He also addressed the deteriorating humanitarian situation in Gaza, reiterating his call for the release of the remaining hostages held by Hamas. Today's global order is not working for everyone. In fact, I would go further and say it's not working for anyone. Our world is facing existential challenges, but the global community is more fragmented and divided than at any time during the past 75 years. When power relations are vague, the dangers of aggressive opportunism and miscalculation grow. And today we see countries doing whatever they like with no accountability. 
Impunity seems to be the name of the game. And so we must all be determined to reestablish the primacy of the rule of law. The situation in Gaza is an appalling indictment of the deadlock in global relations. The level of death and destruction is shocking in itself, and the war is also spilling over borders across the region and affecting global trade. The humanitarian aid operation is now on life support. It's barely functioning. I've repeatedly called for an immediate and unconditional release of all hostages and a humanitarian ceasefire. That is the only way to massively escape up a delivery in Gaza. And this must be the foundation for concrete and irreversible steps towards a two-state solution based on international law and the United Nations resolutions. We desperately need a just and sustained peace for Ukraine, for Russia and for the world. But the peace in line with UN Charter and international law, which establishes the obligation to respect the territorial integrity of sovereign states. And around the world, from the Sahel to Libya and Sudan, from the Great Lakes to the Horn of Africa, from Yemen to Myanmar, we need concerted efforts to strengthen regional organizations and for global powers to pressure the parties to the war to come to the peace table and pursue their goals through negotiations. We need peace with justice. Today's global financial architecture, based on frameworks agreed nearly eight years ago, is outdated, dysfunctional and unfair. The climate crisis is gathering pace. Last year was the hottest on record. It would be the coolest for many years to come. The next few years are decisive. Emissions must have peaked by next year, 2025, and must fall by 45% by 2030. We have the tools. We know what to do. We need to progressively phase out fossil fuels and promote a just and equitable transition to renewable energy led by the G20 countries that are responsible for 80% of global emissions. It is clear that our world is in deep trouble. Global governance in its present form is entrenching divisions and fueling discontent. We must work based on justice with renewed urgency and solidarity. There is always an opportunity to create a more inclusive, comprehensive and effective global order that works for everyone based on international law. UN Security Council Sec Secretary General Antonio Guterres speaking on the situation in Gaza and climate change. In the meantime, the UN Senior Humanitarian and Reconstruction Coordinator for Gaza, Sigit Kag, says the situation in Gaza is affecting the United Nations' ability to deliver assistance. She added that Israel's extension of military operation in Rafah will have serious consequences for innocent civilians. The, I've just uh, had the opportunity to brief, of course, the Council of Foreign Ministers on the uh, Security Council Resolution 2720 on the facilitation, expedition and acceleration of humanitarian assistance into Gaza, as well as negotiations around the establishment of a mechanism which is supposed to verify and monitor. Obviously, we've talked a lot about the very dire humanitarian situation and conditions inside Gaza, uh, all aspects of security that obviously affect also our ability, that of my UN colleagues in country, to deliver assistance and, uh, you know, a lot of questions. I would say um, strong support was issued uh, for the mission, uh, for efforts on the ground uh, and obviously I've also exchanged a number of uh, suggestions uh, in response to questions raised by ministers of foreign affairs. The uh, cu currently an extension of uh, military operation in Rafah will have very dire humanitarian consequences for the innocent civilians that are there. Uh, at the same time we hear very clearly of course the different voices from the Israeli war cabinet, their intent uh, to proceed, the timing it seems to be a matter uh, of discussion. The potential consequences of such an operation at present time would be disastrous. There are more than a million people crammed in Rafah. It's not intended for a million people in shelters, in random uh, sort of uh, sheeted, plastic sheeted uh, constructions. 
Health conditions are very worrisome. We know that uh, aid is not sufficient to get in. It's harder and harder to distribute. We also have to acknowledge the fact that the security conditions separate from military operations due to what is called self-distribution by desperate civilians, but also looting and criminalization is hampering efforts by the humanitarian community, UN and international or local NGOs to deliver assistance to the people that actually need it. It is deeply, deeply troubling. The allegations are, are horrible, of course, uh, for a UN organization. At the same time, it's also very clear when you look at the ability of the international humanitarian community to deliver assistance in Gaza right now, there is no substitute for UNRWA's role at present. And I have reiterated that today. A number of ministers, of course, have also stressed that. But they're still negotiating about their own collective tech.